Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today for our Liquidware webinar, Lock in Savings and Extend Your Hardware with Stratosphere UX. If at any point today you have a question or a comment, please place it in the chat or Q&A window and we will address it as time allows. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording within a few business days. Presenting today will be Jason E. Smith, VP Alliances and Product Marketing with Liquidware, and Thomas Laosua, Technical Director, Strategic Alliances with Liquidware. Jason, you want to get us started? Sure. That was a great intro and great pronunciation of French Tom's name, as we affectionately call him. Better than I could have done him justice. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about how to lock in savings with Stratosphere UX. Thomas is going to share out his screen there. We'll see a few slides. Otherwise, get me today. Lock in savings and extend your hardware lifecycle with Stratosphere UX. And uh, if you if you haven't seen Liquidware before, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the company and our full suite of solutions. So I, I can do that easily on one slide, and we always level set everything by doing that. So we'll click to the next slide, please, Thomas. I tried. Okay, sorry. And uh, digital workspace management, that is Liquidware. And we started in 2009, and we we did that as or, as organizations were rapidly moving towards VDI, virtual desktop infrastructure. We'll talk about how that was uh, a thing that impacted budgets or, or why the industry went that way on the next slide here in a moment. But uh, a little bit more about us, we have a suite of solutions that take you and transform your uh, your desktop enterprise to the next desktop. And that could be that you're about to roll out Windows 11. It could be that you're moving to uh, a data solution like uh, native AVD on Azure. Uh, it could be that you're expanding into Citrix or VMware or Nutanix uh, uh, frame. Uh, it could be anything uh, as long as it's Windows to Windows. Our suite of solutions, we do that through uh, Profile Unity, giving the user environment management one holistic way to manage the user environment so as soon as they log off they can log back in we inject the profile across OS into that new desktop could be in the cloud could, could have gone from on-prem or a laptop to, to the cloud we manage your policies throughout that with context aware settings that go beyond what Microsoft group policy preferences can do and then uh, we have a solution that can help in containerize and uh, deliver the applications as well known as flex app so those those will follow you everywhere there's a new Flex App One feature, so you can even take those Flex Apps offline. Applications are not installed in the base image, keeping them pristine and clean. That's the number one benefit. But they become very portable, so anywhere the user goes, they can follow them. And you can, with Flex App One now, you can even put those in a OneDrive and have them follow users straight into the cloud, um, straight to their offline use, because those containers can reside locally. And it's very flexible with Flex App, keeping those base images clean. We support emerging platforms like Windows 365, Cloud PC, AVD, as well as any other Windows environment with FlexApp. Uh, very high compatibility rating, and that's where it is head and shoulders above Microsoft's MSIX format. Uh, it's in the 90-something percent range, and uh, you can containerize those and take those apps anywhere you go, including offline. Stratosphere. And that's where we're going to park a little bit today. We're going to talk about user experience metrics, digital experience metrics for the user. And what that does is it helps you monitor the user experience for the user, no matter what Windows environment they're in today. Not only that Windows environment, but how they're using applications. Uh, because this is very helpful information to know. So you can size the environment that you're going to appropriately. So you can subscribe to the correct uh, workspace in the cloud, for instance, so you know how desktops are being used to plan for the ones that you're about to roll out to users. And it can also ensure the user, help ensure the user experience once you get there. So if you have SLAs, service level agreements that need to be met um, for total uptime or total um, speed of desktops or processing and everything, Stratosphere can help you, uh, give you the knowledge you need to help you, you hold your vendor's feet to the fire to help guarantee those SLAs. Um, so this suite, it's known as our Liquidware Essential Suite. You get a bundled price if you subscribe to all three. If you um, if you have one, great value. If you have two, it's a little better value, but the, all three is even better value. 
and soon you may have heard about our fourth and forthcoming product called Command Control. And Command Control is help desk and remedi real-time remediation of problems on the desktop. Um, can uh, take over a desktop uh, if a user is having trouble. You can see things in real time. You can kill processes. You can reach out and touch someone. And that's how it's different and complementary to Stratosphere. All right, so next slide. It's budget season. And it's the end of the year here, and that's when a lot of organizations are looking at their budgets. I thought it would be a, 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 a nice walk down memory lane as we talk about the evolution of PCs and how we've chased a more efficient way to deliver PCs. As we're talking about budgets and locking in savings, as we're headed into maybe a, a little bit of rough times in the economy, you'll be prepared uh, once you get to the end of this webinar um, to lock in savings and get the most bang for your buck in in these uh, current times. Um, now, this table is subject to one's opinion, and the one that uh, the one's opinion that it was subject to was my own. So, <laughs> I've been around a number of years and seen these things happen to fruition and evolve. So, uh, I'll walk with you through these, and this is why I use something abstractly like the mainstream years of the standalone PC revolution. We saw that happen. If you think about corporations adopting and throwing typewriters out the window and mini computers like Wang mini computers that would talk to mainframes um, out the window, uh, the PC revolution, putting one on every single user's desktop across the organization. If they had a typewriter, they got a, a PC rapidly in the span of about five or six or seven years. And it just continued on and on where more users had PCs. It's tended to get very expensive very quickly for a lot of these enterprises. And then you had, um, technology was evolving so quickly. You know, you're looking at megabytes of data being held on hard drives in the very first years. And, and that um, went to hundreds of megabytes in just a few years later by the mid nineties. And so you had at best like a two year refresh cycle before that PC was too old. Windows 3.1 came up from that. And uh, every time there was a new revision or new applications, it would take more and more horsepower. So you were flipping desktops a lot. So there, there had to be a better way um, that many people thought. And this was the emergence of really Citrix and remote desktop uh, services for Microsoft that hit the mainstream years. I know Citrix was around since the early 90s. I even did some work with them in the early 90s. But the mainstream years of when that really, really was adopted and, and taken off was 97, uh, estimated to about 2009. Initially, companies rolled it out for remote access. It was a great way when you were on the road, maybe you had a laptop that you carried with you on the road, but you needed to get back to corporate resources because we didn't all, we weren't all on the internet yet in the mid 90s. Um, and so you could get to file servers and things like that. So you could open up applications and you would start a remote session with Citrix, but then it rapidly turned into starting to be a server-based computing model, like a return to the mainframe idea, where you had a Wang mini frame, mini, mini computer talking to a, uh, a mainframe in the back office. Um, this was the same type of concept when you went to server-based computing with Citrix and RDS. And it, uh, uh, hospitals and, 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 and uh, major organizations started to adopt uh, this way of, of doing computing. It initially added cost as a second remote access, but then it started to get more efficient because it was uh, it replaced uh, fat PCs, and you had the emergence of thin clients again, again, sort of like that mini computer and mainframe discussion, but now we're on PCs and servers. Well, that went along just fine and through several named versions of Citrix, uh, everything from Metaframe to the later years, uh, and even before that, WinFrame and whatnot. Then we had virtual desktop infrastructure, and this is another um, opportunity to try to save costs in the way that the desktops were delivered. The main stream years of that, again, 2009 through 2018, and you know, VDI didn't really take off until 2011, 12, 13. It was a slow takeoff. The year of VDI really happened the advent of COVID, and then we were already over at uh, cloud-based workspaces. But the goal of VDI was to save money on PC refresh cycles. Can I reuse my old PCs and just start using uh, a one-to-one? -one? So it was similar to the Citrix server-based computing in environment, uh, and it really served to centralize PC horsepower, but it was a one-to-one -one ratio, and uh, it was another attempt to you know, deliver PCs more cost-efficiently. Now we're at 
the mainstream years of enterprises starting to adopt uh, and, and still adopting cloud-based workspaces. Again, this gives you business agility and continuity, and we saw a lot of this rapidly happen as soon as the world was locked down in 2020, um, where it became key and it became an, an easy decision to say, yes, we do need our, our desktops uh, in the cloud, or at least an extra desktop in the cloud, so we can continue to do business if we have a lockdown or if there's some other business disaster, we have access to them, and it became really uh, a must-have. And, and it was an attempt, again, to make desktops more efficient, to take data centers where you had a one-to-one -one ratio for enterprises having data centers or multiple data centers and shifting those to the cloud. And we've seen that rapidly take place in the last four to five years, you know, right before COVID and into COVID, and COVID really, really started to make that spike. But all this, I would say, is uh, was an attempt to make organizations more efficient uh, as well as users more productive and to lower the cost of that one-to-one -one PC uh, revolution that started. So it was a, a little fun task as we talk about budget season here. We'll go on to the next uh, slide. And uh, Kristen, I believe we have a poll question though. We can talk about that too. Um, so thanks for putting that up. And if you'll participate with us, the quicker you participate, the quicker we'll go on to the next slide because this will show on the screen all at once for everyone. How do you anticipate your budgets for next year to be? Same as 22, lower than 22, or higher than 22. So if you'll get your votes in, we'll be able to proceed on to the next slide. We'll leave that poll question up for just a moment. So as you're thinking about that, we have that up. I'm coming to you today from Alpharetta, Georgia, so just north of Atlanta. Thomas, where are you? Just outside Boston, where the uh, the fall like, actually started to show its face, so it's cold. No snow yet. No, although I saw that on the forecast for today, so I keep an eye uh, on out the window. I, I, uh, I think I know where that snow is coming from, Kristen. I, I can tell you, because we have our <laughs> first snow today going on. Woke up to a dusting, and now I, I bet you were about an inch, and I'm outside of Chicago. So, Thomas, maybe heading your way. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. It's pretty. The first one is pretty. Oh, I I, I, uh, I love snow, actually. I don't mind, uh, especially because it means that I don't have to do any yard work. That's, that's true. That is true. That's right. It's the time of year where the... Uh, landscapers start putting their snow shovels on the front of those trucks don't they oh yeah all right how are you on the on the we got 68 percent voted um get a few more votes in real quick if you haven't voted select an option so we'll have better data the more data we have the better the result will be to share with you not too private of a question either same as 22 lower than 22 or higher than 22 your budgets we're not going to track these as a one-to-one, -one, so I'm not going to know if your budget's higher. We're still going to have our salespeople call on you regardless. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, okay, so you want to wrap it up? We've got 68% yeah. of the folks that okay, have voted. Okay, that's good. Okay, and let me share. We've got 38% saying the same as 2022. 38% saying lower than 2022, and 24% saying higher than 2022. You know, I, I wouldn't have uh, started to guess what that would be, but it sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Um, some organizations may be uh, raising this due to inflation and other things they perceive as cost. Others may be tightening their belts. And then others is a safe bet to just go ahead and uh, budget what we budgeted last year. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks for that, Kristen. All right. So um, we did some work with Freeform Dynamics not long ago, and, and then they did a separate survey, and this was not with us, but I want to give full credit to Freeform Dynamics. They're out of the UK. Great, great analyst firm to work with and research firm to work with. They said we could use a couple of slides from this deck as, as they talked about, they were talking about budgets and things, but um, well, and I found a couple of slides in there quite interesting if you're in the budget season there. And we'll get into the direct ways that you can lock in your savings with Stratosphere in just a moment. But uh, if you look at these, budget structures can be your friend or enemy. So um, 
the question that they asked who they polled was turning to funding. Does your organization have fixed IT budgets set and reviewed on an annual or quarterly basis? And 58% of them tended to have um, a fixed type budget. You know, this is almost in line with those poll numbers we just put up, isn't it? If we think about that, because when you add a couple of those together and you're looking at the fixed budgets uh, and then you get progressively to probably smaller and SMBs don't have as much of a fixed budget. It's spend as you go or necessary spending. So it's interesting to see where you might fall as an organization and if you have that predefined budget or if you're a little more flexible. Next slide. We will kind of talk about OPEX versus CAPEX, and we won't get too deep into that today because any savings is savings is what the way that we'll show it. You can save both CAPEX and OPEX with uh, liquidware solutions. But I will say that, you know, this debate um, had caused uh, some questions here, and it'll, it'll give you some insight on CAPEX versus OPEX. CAPEX being things that, you know, you generally pay for up front. Operating expenditures are things that go along as you as time goes along. So monthly monthly payments or multi-year um, multi installments, things like that would be operating expenditure costs. When you lease something or when your PCs go to the cloud, for example, in a full DAS solution, you're, you're more, you're almost exactly all, all the way over there to the right in that OPEX situation. Whereas CAPEX, a PC on a desktop, a one-to-one -one ratio. So a lot of organizations are somewhere in between with that for PCs. Um, the question was, when funding IT investments, uh, does your organization have a preference when it comes to capital expenditure or operational expenditure. You know, we can talk about licensing too, because a lot of organizations are, um, a lot of vendors like us uh, have slowly moved over to a subscription license. Citrix did it and VMware did it a long time ago where it was mandated. And uh, anything that we've done along those lines have emulated some of the things that they've done at their lead, but um, perpetual licenses versus subscription licenses have, have, have moved along. But it looks like organizations typically prefer CapEx and they probably because they uh, have more predictable cost up front. Tax ramifications can be different though, CapEx versus OpEx, where you have to depreciate things for capital expenditure versus being able to, uh, to write them off as you go with operating expenditures. Um, but more organizations preferring capital expenditures. And this is a, this is a bit of a, um, it's against the grain when you think about the way that DAS desktops are rolled out, but this is what organizations tend to prefer, capital expenditures. Um, curious to know uh, where any of you fall, and you can use that chat window right over there and let us know where your organization falls. This is reflective of it, and we can look at those comments. If you have questions throughout, let us know. Next slide, please. This is where we'll get to the, a little bit more to the heart of what we're going to talk about. Stratosphere UX from us is an agent-based uh, solution that reports back to a, a virtual appliance, uh, our hub. And in that collector hub, it's, it's collecting data from all your endpoints. And it knows uh, and it can learn more about the user experience than I would bet just about any other digital experience monitoring solution out there. And if, if there is a metric to pick up, you can just about bet Stratosphere is going to have it over the competition. We have uh, more visibility in that too. And, and our product manager and product director of Stratosphere likes to say, I have a bigger windshield. I have more left to right than I have, and I have more up and down visibility than any other monitoring solution. Now, what you do with this data it becomes uh, more of a challenge to get just the data that you want. So if you know Stratosphere, you know that our reporting engine is very powerful and we have uh, different views, and that's getting better as we go along. In 6.7, it's going to have even a more enhanced view through the, through the GUI, and um, we're uh, blessed to have Thomas with us here today because Stratosphere can have outputs in any type of reporting mechanism like uh, Power BI, and he is uh, our resident expert in helping customers uh, take that data and put it into Power BI to any type of format that they wish. But the end-to-end -end metrics include everything from machine inventory, all the things about the BIOS, the make model serial number, uh, application inventory. So not only the application inventory and giving you very specifics about that, and you get that with many tools but in the market, but can you get application usage and performance out of that? And Stratosphere gives you both applications installed versus which ones are being used. That's very helpful to know because if you're doing a transformation, you need to know 
are these applications even still used by specific groups? And we can tell you that data at a glance. User inventory, all the way down to um, the distinct name of the user and login breakdown, how long each individual one takes. Uh, machine performance, um, especially graphics and network uh, graphics load and networks latency. Uh, machine security, so we can uh, pick up all those metrics that will help make sure your organization is secure and help you do an audit for security. Um, machine health, so CPU temperature and battery charge level, and that's very helpful as you would guess on your remote work from home users and uh, their laptops. So when they call the help desk, you can see things at a glance, how healthy that machine is. And maybe it's sitting on their bed on a blanket and it can't breathe and the fan can't blow. And so the CPU temperature could be very telling, couldn't it? Because it might be throttling that machine back. So we can get that detailed uh, down to any type of a level. And we have added many metrics for work from anywhere users. Uh, including Wi-Fi access point, the estimated distance the user is away from that, because that can impact help desk calls as well. And we can correlate uh, your physical to virtual resources. So, you know, when the user's logged on to a, a, their physical machine, you can see the metrics that correlate to the virtual machine, like the Citrix machine or AVD machine in the cloud, VMware, any others. We like to say all users, all machines, all applications, and all the time. So very comprehensive digital experience metrics from Stratosphere UX. To start to talk about how we can save you money on a case by case basis, uh, transfer uh, control over to Thomas. Thank you, Jason. So um, we're gonna now get into the, the deep of the, uh, the, uh, the subject for this webinar. And we took, uh, I wanna take a second to explain how we approach this. Uh, when we prepared this deck with Jason, for this uh, for this session, we thought we would take a, a slightly different approach. Um, usually, uh, vendors, software vendors like us, we look at our features and our data, and we present what we think the benefits are. Uh, we highlight the uh, the pain points, highlight the benefits, and then we move forwards. Um, and specifically, when it comes to Stratosphere, and actually that's true of, of pretty much all the solution, we strive to be uh, the the tip of the spear. Um, really, we we strive to always bring features or uh, benefits, or in the case of Stratosphere, data that nobody else does. So by putting us, putting us on the forefront of, of innovation kind of force us to, to be honest, guess sometime, hey, we're going to add that feature, we're going to add that, that, uh, that data points, and we think you're going to benefit from it. And usually that's how I would say 90% of the, the vendor presentation goes. They look at their benefits, they explain it, but let's face it, some of it is um, just guesswork. So we took a different approach this time and we ignore everything you can see on that screen or, or, or all our features. Instead, we gather feedback from our customers, took a survey through our field and kind of tried to organize the feedback specifically around cost saving. And maybe the first thing that surprised, it, surprised us was the number of use cases. So the rest of the presentation, we're gonna walk you through the different use cases. They're not sorted by importance or by type. Uh, we try to put some logic behind it, but instead we're just gonna walk you through each individual use case that we saw, uh, actually not all of them, um, the main one, and um, explain to you how we achieve that. Uh, it's important to note that Every single use case we're gonna to present today is based on real life examples. So it's coming straight from customers where we learn as much as we, um, um, as we help and learn on how our product help. There is a bunch of them, but I would, I would say generally speaking, they can be, they can be put in three categories on, on how we generate those cost savings. One being just, intelligence or monitoring through monitoring and, and, and providing data, accurate data helps make right decision. So that's a big one. Next is diagnostics and the ability to quickly pinpoint where is my bottleneck or where, where's my issue or what's causing downtime for my users. And third is optimization. So the ability to optimize your, um, your image, your desktop, your hardware refresh cycle and, and so on and so forth. So everything, everything you're gonna see from, from now on to the rest 
will be can be probably put in one of those three categories. Again, starting not necessarily in order, but the first one and probably the the first thing that comes to mind when someone or a customer or or a um, someone thinks about Stratosphere is diagnostic, because that's what most of our marketing is, and it's true. Uh, our main main use case is the ability to pinpoint and and solve problems. Now there different type of issues and different type of problem we solve. I would say generally speaking, where we see the biggest bang for the buck are not necessarily single user problem. Like, hey, I can't log in. It's more about changes that happen to your environment that impact many users, either like one time per day or all the time. A good example of that and something we've seen uh, as a recurring um, uh, theme in our conversation with our customers is new application or new OS rollout. Well, new application, and there's no ne not necessarily a uh, due diligence on, hey, how is that going to impact my environment? Um, we've seen that where everybody downloaded and deployed Teams and Zoom during COVID. So one of the one of the the, the approach here is to actually leverage Stratosphere UX to first and foremost recognize and identify. Uh, the impact on your environment. And best practice would be before you do the rollout, deploy that into a pilot environment, measure the impact of that application on your environment before you decide to uh, to deploy. This will streamline basically your, your entire application lifecycle while at the same time improve your user experience. Another use case, I'm going to flip that coin, is single user. And the whole idea here, we have an integration into um, uh, tools like ServiceNow. That allows you to bring the power of Stratosphere, which is really the data, uh, straight on the front line of your help desk so that when they have a call, they can immediately access all the, the information about that user or that desktop. And no application, network, um, user activity application and so on, so it can speed up the time time to resolution and reduce downtime. Next, we're going to look at something that's probably not even thought of at first when considering strategy or, or thinking about it, all about security and compliance reporting. Simply put, um, those two aspects are becoming more and more demanding and more and more complex. Uh, you are, as an IT organization, you're usually faced with increasingly uh, more demanding requests for maintain security posture, compliance posture. Using Stratosphere allows you to get that data quickly across the platform. So you don't necessarily have to have multiple tools for physical and virtual and cloud. You can have a single compliance report that will give you your, your security posture, but also your compliance posture. And we know how this could become um, complex or difficult for um, Microsoft licensing, for example, uh, either Windows or, or Office. Um, the big big plus here that has been uh, pointed to us by, by customers is the uh, one, the fact that it's cross-platform, but the other one being that it's fairly uh, up-to-date. So they can have a, a report based on the latest hour and get that data on a daily or hourly basis. So they're always up-to-date. Since we're talking about compliance, um, I should be remiss if I'm, I don't address one thing that's been probably one of the most um, used uh, benefit of strategy here, and that is license cost recoup. And I like that one because there is um, almost zero time to benefit on, on that approach. We don't need to be running for a month. Uh, you could be running for a week and you can run one report Immediately, that's going to show you what application do you use and what application you don't use, making it really easy to look through those and identify where you can actually save money. Now, those savings are, are probably not day one, but as you can imagine, just going through support renewal, especially in the budget uh, time period, having that vision of what application are actually used versus not those who are not. Uh, obviously, the one that you're paying money for uh, could be tremendously useful to find 
uh, bucket of saving that could help you with your budget. Right sizing. Right sizing is, is probably one of my favorites. And the whole idea here is that what we see day in, day out, and that's probably true of every customer. So it's not, I wouldn't call that a mistake. I think it's just the way uh, deployments are and, and the way desktop have been provisioned since um, dawn of time. Desktop or provision, whether they are physical, virtual, or cloud, based on quote unquote user profile. You're an accountant, you get this. You're in marketing, you get that. What we see on the back end is that that approach is, can be tremendously misleading because a, uh, a job function doesn't describe your compute needs. Simple as that. And I can probably take any organization and take two people in the same BU or same division, let's say marketing, that have very different requirements in terms of CPU, memory, disk, network, GPU, et cetera, et cetera. So what we see, it's almost a guarantee, kind of the same as the unused application. Every time we deploy Stratosphere for the first time is we're going to see a portion of those desktop that are either underused or overused. Now, underuse is, for you guys, is easy money. Uh, that machine has been deployed. You've been given a, a machine with eight CPUs and 60 or four gigs of RAM, and you don't even touch 10% of any of those. If that desktop is, well, it doesn't matter actually, physical, virtual, or, or cloud, it only, the only thing that, it, that impacts is the time of benefits. If it's cloud and you're paying a subscription, those benefits are almost instant. Well, next month, you're getting a two CPUs and 60, uh, 16 gigs of RAM, and I just jumped that price for that cloud desktop from $560 to 234 Done. So those are, are really, uh, I would love to call them, when we do return on investment or, or saving analysis, those are almost what I would call the low hanging fruit. Really easy to, uh, to identify. Undersize might be counterintuitive. Um, yeah, you're not saving money um, by, um, having a desktop that's way smaller than it should be. What it, this will lead to is downtime, loss in productivity. It takes the user twice the amount of, amount of time that it regularly takes to do his job. A, is he or she is not gonna be happy, and two, you're losing time on productivity. So either way, you're either um, generating downtime because of poor user experience or wasting resource. So Stratosphere is, is, and we'll go through that through a, a customer example, um, using Stratosphere, you can actually really uh, easily, A, identify what's, you know, of course, unused application, but most importantly, understand what do you have, CPU, compute power, et cetera, et cetera. What do you actually use? And, and what matters here is Stratosphere is by, by by um, concept, a what I call the historical database, which means that, yes, we're gonna give you the now and, and what's happening right now, but it also gives you the ability to say, well, I wanna see that group of user or, or, or that specific user show it to me from a trend analysis over the past week or month. And that's where it gets important uh, or critical because right now, I don't know, maybe he's busy, maybe he's not. But if I, if I start to um, do a trend analysis over that group of user over the past month, I can see a peak, I can see averages, I can see when do they log in and so on and so forth. Again, going back to that idea of um, making good decision based on intelligent data. Physical asset recovery. This one is, is a little bit of left field, but I, I thought was really interesting. Um, and you might or might not relate to that, but we thought it was important to put in there. And this one comes from a, a specific customer where the IT staff knew they had pools of physical desktop, more organized in a, in a kiosk environment, but they knew that whatever uh, amount of machine they have or invested into were underused, but they had no way to actually prove that to the budget committee. So they used Stratosphere to monitor not so much the CPU and memory and, and D space use, but actual user, user behavior. How many users logged into that machine? Um, 
how long do they use it for? How much time was it uh, of that time was active or, or idle? Based on that, they were able to reduce their entire fleet by one third, uh, which is gigantic. So uh, interesting, uh, maybe, maybe I would say on the, um, on more on the um, exception basis of, of use cases, still, I thought that was really interesting to people. Now we're going to switch a little bit and talk about a feature for once, um, which is all about uh, one specific feature in Stratosphere called Optimizer. Optimizer gives you the ability to change dynamically change priority of your running processes on any given desktop based on user activity. Simply put, it's uh, going to elevate the priority for the in-focus application, aka the application on your background, like for me right now, that would be PowerPoint. PowerPoint will get more share of resources than everything running on the background. We also give the ability to um, save on memory by, by executing memory trimming action on the application running on the background, things that are left untouched, et cetera. The end results are, are multiple. They're subtle or maybe uh, subtle, but very important. It increase or maintain user experience, meaning that if I'm a user running on an old hardware, or I've been given a laptop or a virtual desktop that's below my need, uh, I'm going to run, I'm going to open 40 different tabs of, of uh, web browsers, and it's more than what the machine can chew. Optimizer is going to mitigate that lack of resources. Even when you're reaching uh, contention on resource, your application on the foreground always have priority. So less impact, less slowdown, better user experience. Now if we look at the uh, cost saving perspective, where it gets really interesting is more on the, um, on the life cycle of the machine, specifically for, um, for machine, a physical machine. Using optimizer, uh, gives you the ability to extend the life of existing hardware that would be due to, um, to for a hardware refresh, uh, let's say, for example, uh, next year. By just turning on Optimizer, you can give that hardware a lifespan of another one, two years, and therefore generate cost savings or cost avoidance uh, right, right now, as you think, or at least on the, on the hardware refresh cycle. Oops, here we go. So is there uh, just a use? We, have, we may have a question yeah. you can come in. Yeah, please. Okay. Stratosphere UX does not take any action at the endpoints, only reports on gaps or issues. So it's a good question. Uh, when it comes down to usage, pure usage data, yeah, we're hundred percent a monitoring tool. Uh, we're not gonna take action. The exception being optimizer. Um, so optimizer will take action on the endpoint or on the on the on the virtual desktop uh, to optimize your user experience. Yep, and then we've got command control beta that just started. So if you'd like to get involved in that, let us know because um, that solution can take action based on real time data that we're collecting there, and you can even see and go back in time through a DVR feature. So you can go back and see what task manager was doing an hour ago, two hours ago, the day before. So um, that solution complements Stratosphere. We hope to ship that in the first quarter of next year. But that's our take action, reach out and touch someone solution. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Kristen. So when does process optimization come into play? And actually that, that plays very well in, into that, that slide. Um, I put a big focus on physical uh, desktop and extended life cycle, but the reality is, uh, again, looking back at our customers, we've seen a, a fair amount of use cases throughout the different platform, physical, virtual, and cloud. Um, some of the reasons include change. Uh, the Windows OS churn that is, uh, even if you do nothing, as long as you update your Windows environment, which you should if you want to stay compliant, uh, will slowly but surely takes more and more resource out of your desktop application, whether it's new install application or, or uh, upgrades, 
will also change the layout uh, of your how your your resources are being used. Um, other other aspects are includes what I would call migration. So you start to move some of your users from from physical to virtual or cloud, and those although you could you would think they have the same footprint in terms of uh, application and and resource usage. If you take the same image running on the physical desktop, run that on the virtual or cloud, you're going to have an overhead uh, taken by the virtualization layer. That needs to be taken into consideration. In other words, um, resources, as you go through time, are shrinking. But user expectations uh, are the same. They want the same performance. They don't call it user experience. They call it, I want the thing to be the same as um, as um, as it was before, and that's where it um, that's where it, it plays a role. Everything's happening in the background, so optimi optimizer will behave without you having to touch it once you set it on. Really, all you have to do is turn it on, and it will intelligently uh, react and and manage that performance automatically based on what it sees. Um, we were actually curious about trying to measure the impact. Uh, we knew that Optimizer would give you um, better user experience, but how do you track that? Because um, yes, my foreground application might be responding faster, but my background application are gonna be slower. Metrics being metrics on paper, if I don't have CPU queue, let's say for example, swapping uh, for my, my application on the foreground, I'm going to generate more on the left end on everything in the background. So on paper, everything should be zeros. Um, and so we connected, we, we actually created a number of, of custom reports, uh, as Jason mentioned, using our API and, and um, business intelligence tool like Power BI, and gave that to customers to actually track and learn from it. What we've learned is that in uh, Every, I was going to say the majority, but no, every scenario, every customer we've, we've implemented, we've seen a net improvement in actual resource consumption, as well as in user experience. So you can see here the background. I would say that um, generally speaking, in average, where we see the most benefit from using Optimizer is memory consumption. A huge drop if you're using memory trimming. To give you a highlight of how Optimizer work and number of actions, to look at, we took a look at the application uh, on a process by process basis, almost minute by minute activity throughout the pool. And this one is a good example. I wanted to see how Optimizer uh, behave um, and, and, and I would say impact each of them. To do that, uh, this analysis looked at application on the, on the top of your slide is are the application which are in the in focus or in the the, uh, the foreground. So application being used. One on the bottom are everything else in the background not being used. Those could be uh, system services and and so on and so forth. Two things I wanted to to um, uh, draw your attention to is if you look at the squiggly lines on top, optimizer will react. And this is number of actions it's taking where we act immediately to user activity. More application or launch or switch over, just alt tabbing from one to another, will trigger immediately, this is instant, action from optimizers. Optimizer uh, actions can be counted in the thousands on a typical deployment. Now, if you look on the bottom, where I see the, the impact being the, the most um, Obvious is if you again look at that that graph, the, those compare the application used, uh, sorry, the memory used by application again on the application in the background with and without optimizer. And you can see the net difference in terms of pure memory consumption just by having optimizers turn turn on on the back end. So uh, before we wrapped up, I wanted to uh, switch gear a little bit and talk about not so much a use case related to a benefit, 
but use case that we've seen more and more in the past year or so. And those are more related to, I would say, customer event or, or uh, your organization events. The first one, uh, as we know, it's a, it's a dodgy market out there. And we've seen our, our fair share of acquisition and in, investors from customers. Um, in those cases, those, when those happen, they usually um, generate a lot of stress on the IT environment, uh, simply because you're asked to ingest or incorporate an environment that have different standards, different platform, and so on and so forth. Strategy, and I won't get too much into details, but this is a perfect time to leverage Stratosphere, to get a sense, to get a full assessment of the new environments you're, you're acquiring and get a sense of how can you incorporate that, um, build everything based on a standard image and plan so that the transition is, is, um, is um, fairly smooth. Um, and so you don't have any surprises. Budget cap. We talked about it, and and this is the uh, the other one that, uh, to be honest, we've we're starting to see more recently, uh, not in the past two three years, but something that unfortunately is is becoming more a reality. And the whole idea here, and and we're seeing an acceleration of customers that are starting to look at how Stratosphere can save money to adjust their budget to the pressure they're getting into. Everything we mentioned before can be rolled into one view of Stratosphere and, and going through whether you, you're looking at extending the, the life cycle of your hardware device, right-sizing your uh, virtual or cloud desktop, um, reducing your application footprint. All of them are opportunities to actually generate savings that you can then um, prioritize and say, okay, we're gonna sell by this, this, and this. And basically give you uh, give you back money you can allocate for your project for next year. It's a great example, and we actually gonna take a uh, finish with a customer use case. So this is a real story. This is fairly recent, um, where we we run into a customer that filled our online uh, return on investment survey, and Jason will touch on that at the end of this this presentation. So we got the survey. It's an online survey, and and in that survey, you describe your, your project or your environment, and we typically come back with a customized report that says, hey, based on what you told us, this is what we think we can save you uh, using your tools. It's not limited to Stratosphere. It also includes potential savings generated by Profile Unity or Flexa. So the customer filled the initial ROI survey. There was about 15,000 users, uh, both physical and cloud desktop, they're running a, uh, they moved a, a significant portion of their users on Azure since COVID, really. And the first thing they weren't happy about is they roughly achieved half the, the user density than what they had before. So we connected the uh, ROI analysis, again, just based on a, a fairly quick survey, and came back with something like $4 million in savings, including soft and hard cost and places where we thought we can save money. We presented the uh, the uh, the analysis to uh, to the customers, and the the uh, the feedback was, well, that's great, but I don't care about soft costs. Remove that. Uh, there's no no play for me. It doesn't doesn't have an impact. I I don't really um, rely on them. And those numbers sounds too good to be true. So I'd like you to adjust. Your, your ROI analysis, but based on actual data. Uh, you have Stratosphere running as a POC in my environment. Why don't we take a look and see if we can adjust those, those assumptions and come back with data? I should point out at this time that it, it feels like that's how the storyline goes. The customer was not difficult. Um, it was actually enjoyable uh, to go through all those what-if scenarios. Um, so it was it was great, but I'm going to make him sound like he's a difficult customer. Well, he's not. So we went back and say, OK, uh, no problem. Uh, we have Stratosphere running on a subset of uh, subset of the environment. We run a few reports uh, uh, from Stratosphere, and we revised our, our copy. We removed the soft costs, gone. And we pinpoint three 
um, cost savings area that we thought were uh, important. The first one being application optimization. Again, a lot of apps running that could be uh, removed. Right sizing, uh, that was probably the, the biggest things where we saw that um, their desktop, their Azure uh, template was not the right one. I think they were oversized by um, just being cautious, making sure that th those users would not uh, get poor user experience because of that. I should point out that those are multi-user or multi-session user, um, multi-session desktop, sorry, running on Azure. So application, right sizing, and finally turning on optimizer. One on the uh, on the endpoint device, obviously, uh, extended lifecycle of, of, uh, of their desktop, but also to see if by mixing optimizer with the right sizing of Azure desktop, we could provide cost saving and, um, and uh, at the same time maintain um, user experience. I think there is a question. Let me pause for a second. Yes, thank you, Thomas. We do have a question. Did Stratosphere UX evolve from analyzing VDI environments and the performance slash success of the VDI applications on the endpoints? Yes, um, it's. Um, uh, I would say VDI is. Uh, I don't want to say it's it's dead because it's not. But what we've seen as a use case lately, I would say in the past two three years. Um, We've we've seen a lot of things change. Uh, one of them being the um, the acceleration of migration to the cloud. So a lot of our features and and benefits and and focus really have shifted uh, to expand our vision to cloud desktop as well. Um, we also had a lot of I would say addition into the application stack because application became more portable if you want and and more across like. Now I can deploy my, my application to the physical desktop using Intune. Physical assets, strangely, uh, weirdly actually, also became kind of back in focus. Uh, your laptop, your IGL, thin clients, your whatever you're using becomes almost more important uh, than the virtual desktop you're accessing into. So a lot of features and, and, and uh, data tracking has been, has been added to that. And finally, I would say, um, What's important and what's not important also shifted a bit. We we lightly touch on compliance, we uh, and, and security, but that's becoming more and more a focus. So as a result, we've added and, and collaborated with with um, platform vendors to add those components into Stratosphere. So now we offer a, a visibility. For example, are you compliant from a security perspective? Um, and we know it's either going to become more increasingly important. And obviously, vendor of change. <laughs> uh, it used to be a two men's game, but now it's like a four or five game, uh, men's game. Um, so yeah, obviously we have we had to adapt and, and adjust. Thank you. Um, Thank you. All right. So we revised our copy and came back with a more reasonable quote unquote savings, about two point two million dollars in hot cost savings. So we were, uh, to be honest. We were uh, before we jumped into that session with a customer. We were pretty happy with ourselves and and fairly proud. Um, but they actually came back and says, "Well, that's nice, uh, that's awesome, but uh, we're under budget pressure." I won't share, obviously, not the customer name, but they are in an industry that right now is under is I would say on the receiving end of the. Um, the, the the latest financial turmoil. Um, so the booming, um, I would say, housing market combined with inflation and the next recession is not doing that that industry any favor. Simply put, the executive come back and says, "Listen, we're not spending a dollar in any other uh, in any investment whatsoever next year unless it saves us two dollars, hard cost, immediate." Year one saving, period. If you can't prove that, and of course, you know, it cannot be pie in the sky, used car salesman kind of pitch saying, yeah, yeah, of course you'll save $2 million. You need to be able to prove it to me, and it's got to be one plus one equal two. Right, nice challenge. So we took that upon, 
And what we agreed upon, it says, well, we have the POC running. Uh, so we're monitoring a subset of your, your uh, product chain environments. Why don't we actually implement some of the change? Uh, so we talked about it and decided that some things could not be done right away. It's product chain after all. Um, it was kind of, it was, it was going to take too long to rethink the base image, remove some application and so on and so forth. So basically it says, you know what, forget that. So we're not going to look into how much we're going to save by, by turning up some of the processes or, or services. Great. We're going to focus on two things, right sizing and optimizing. So optimizer is easy. We're just going to turn it on, period. Done. Two seconds. It's done. It's over. Right sizing was more of a back and forth. We wanted to go aggressive because we thought that um, by changing the instant type, they could get way more users than what they're getting in terms of density. The customer wanted to take more of the, you know, let's walk before we run approach, which again, I, I can't fault them for that. We have nothing to lose. We're just a vendor. They, you know, they don't want, and, and we're talking about production and users. So, um, they decided to take like a halfway step, which was, hey, we're going to get uh, one of the appliances you recommended, which is not giving me the full benefit, but at least it's, it's going to give me more CPU, et cetera, for the same price. So we did that. And of course, we monitor ourselves. The end result was $1.5 million that we can prove. It wasn't like, hey, we estimate you can, no, no, no. It's if you apply those change on that subset of user, if you look on the top right, those are their actual numbers, I believe, unless I'm wrong. We increased the density from eight to 11, oh, almost 12. So about, about three and a half user per, per machine. So you extend that over 15,000 users. And if you're familiar with the cost around Azure uh, per machine, you can get a sense of, of how is that gonna impact? You basically increase your density by close to 50%, not, not actually 50%, but 40%. So being very conservative, $1.5 million in the hot cut saving is they, if they only do those two things. They don't extend the life cycle of the hardware device, which is additional saving. They don't uh, revise their application uh, landscape, which is probably another million dollars in savings. They don't even go with the, I would say, more balanced or aggressive um, appliance recommendation which probably would lead to more savings. Um, so that was a great, I would say, journey. Uh, and again, it's, it's not that often, um, speaking from the vendor side, of, obviously, that you get a, a customer that actually calls on your claim and says, wow, that's great. You just showed me 2.5 or $4 million in savings, but I really know what's behind it. I need, you know, let's put the, the, the money where your mouth is, is that actually, prove it. So, um, so that was a great journey and uh, we learned a lot uh, when it comes to savings. But it's actually something that all of you on the call today could achieve. And uh, I'll pass the, uh, the relay back to Jason uh, to wrap us up and talk Thanks. about- Thanks, Thomas. ROI and this is great. Excellent. Yeah, Thomas and I have gone through this exercise with several, um, prospects and current customers and it, it's different for every single customer we can save you money uh, we just need to do a little bit of an investigative process uh, and it is hard cost that we can save and sometimes it's so unbelievable that we have to um, call back the uh, the estimated cost savings just so they uh, the customer can pass it along to their executive team because it's almost unbelievable but we have we saved some customers on a on a uh, like 20x on what their investment is with Stratosphere. Seven million dollars, easy savings, especially when you start to talk about hardware costs and extending the life cycle of hardware costs. Another one that Thomas touched on was we know applications in use. So if you're about to do a software audit and you say, look, why, why did we give everyone something expensive like Adobe Creative Suite, the full suite, all they needed was the ability to edit some PDFs or to read PDFs. You can see those things at a glance. Maybe it's CAD CAM. You rolled it out to too many desktops and you do an audit. You see that it's not even used on 90% of those desktops. We give you easy license cost savings. 
Um, to get started with your own customized ROI, if you're an enterprise with over, say, 500, uh, 500 to 1,000 uh, workspaces, we'll gladly go through this with you. Um, just uh, there's a URL that we'll put in the window. Kristen, I pasted it in. I don't know if you were able to share that out to the ROI survey. If you fill that out, we'll get right back with you. Uh, likely your regional uh, territory manager as well as Thomas will engage with you and we'll find out, you know, what do you value your employees at per hour, for example? Um, how many PCs do you have and things like that? We'll go over all that with you in the applications and we'll give you a cost savings estimate on what you can see as a, to lower your TCO and, and uh, to give you the best return on your investment. So uh, we do have a, a prize to give away today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen. You can email us at any time, you know, and if you have further questions after today's webinar. Kristen, who's our winner winner? Okay, our winner of today's Speakeasy gift set is Sean Mabbitt. Sean will be reaching out to you uh, sending you an email, so please take a look as, so that we have the right address to send that out. Thanks for staying on today uh, all the way through the end. Excellent job today, Jason and Thomas. Any questions, sales at liquidware.com or marketing at liquidware.com. And take a look for uh, the link to the recording and share it with some colleagues. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Kristen. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You.